All right, here we go. We're going to start World War I here, get the causes, get the, the action between, and then make sure to, to talk about the end and why some people say that the treaty that ended World War I started World War II. But here we go. So we're talking 1914 to 1919. Those are the years, okay? So in between this, there's going to be some carnage. And I, and I guess to understand World War I, you've got to understand that this is modern technology. The Industrial Revolution playing out on, on the battlefield, the difference being that the tactics, well, they remain the same. It's the technology that makes this war just entirely more destructive and, and nasty and, and quite sinister in many ways, okay? Now, at the beginning of World War I, there's a lot of hope. Uh, humanity as a whole is on the rise in, in some ways. You know, you're looking at this new wave of technology and saying this is, this is you know, life-changing. And we're, we're in this, uh, this huge amount of hope, and then we see all of that hope sort of dissipate and disappear as World War I happens. Um, and it'll leave us with what we call disillusionment at the end, where we're feeling really, really let down by all the progress that we did have. And we just chose to use it for, for all this awful carnage. So let's begin. We, we measure this war in millions. We use high technology to, to kill each other, and so that creates that, that effect where we're going from thousands to millions. And while it starts in, in, in June 28th, 1914, it's in many ways going to end in, in 1919. So um, let's do it. Let's begin here. Let's start with the spark. So this graphic organizer is really good to help you understand the, the basics of World War One, and I start with um, the M in what we have, Maine. The M stands for militarism, the buildup of one's military. So if you have uh, 50 tanks, then the uh, Germans might want 100 tanks, okay? If, um, if you have 1,000 rifles in Great Britain, then the Austro-Hungarians are going to want 2,000. It's like this back and forth build up. And when you build up your military that much, I, I guess on the one hand, some people say, oh, that's a way to deter people because if they have a huge military, maybe you won't mess with them. But you have all this military and all this money going into the military that it almost becomes this issue of like, you're going to use it. Eventually, it's going to be used. And so it's, there's two ways of looking at militarism, but ultimately, it's going to lead to war. So build up a military. The A stands for alliances. Everyone had an alliance. Everyone was on somebody's team. And they believed that the alliance system would actually prevent war. If everyone had friends, then it would be less likely for there to be a war to break out because uh, you'd be afraid that all their friends would gang up on you. Well, what really starts to happen is because one person has friends, you know, one conflict can create a domino effect and bring everyone else into it because everyone is connected somehow. So this might be the most important cause of World War One. The I stands for imperialism. And you know the definition, right? When a stronger nation takes over a weaker nation for economic or military gain. Imperialism is going to lead to that rivalry. It's going to lead to that hunger for resources and people wanting to uh, fight to claim others' resources and take others' resources. And so that's going to be part of this conflict, imperialism. And then last but not least, the N is for you know extreme pride in your nation, what we call nationalism. Some people, uh, quite famous French, uh, I believe it was Charles de Gaulle, who said that uh, patriotism right, is the love of your nation. Nationalism might be that you love your nation so much that you hate all others. And it is nationalism that's going to uh, become this ugly thing where it's German versus French. And we take the human element out of it, and it's nation versus nation. And that's going to lead to some uh, real bad feelings and some real real nasty uh, battles between, between all sides. And to spark it all, we have the assassination of Franz Ferdinand. I'll tell you a little bit about that. You'll have to come to class to really get the full effect. <clears throat> so... You should have militarism down. I, I teach it as, you know, if, if, if one classroom's going to, you know, build up a bunch of paper balls, you you might do the same thing. And when the bell rings, you're going to start throwing them at each other because you're afraid, right, that they're going to build it up and catch you off guard. And so you build up your, mili your, your papers so that you can, you know, go after them. It's the same idea. You're building up your military. The alliance system 
this is where uh, the war is made and I'm going to take you through the alliances and who's friends with who and, and try to tell you why and, and, and give you that and I probably won't do a 100% great job at it because there are so many more alliances than I could ever hope to cover in just this video but I'll get you the most important ones. I'll definitely do that. So, um, the, the basics, uh, the two sides of this war essentially will be Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy on one side, though Italy will flip, as we'll see. Um, and then the Triple Entente, uh, what we'll call the Allies much later, that's what they sort of refer to themselves as. But the Triple Entente uh, would be Great Britain, France, and Russia. These are the, the way that it, it shook out. This is the major alliance system. Things will shift, things will change, and ultimately what we'll do is we'll call Germany's side the Central Powers, and we'll call Great Britain's side the Allied Powers, and that's how it, it becomes known, and that's really what I need you to, to understand. These are just the alliances before war. Once war breaks out, they change their names. They make it actually a little bit more easy to understand, if you believe me on that. So the actual sides of the war would be Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. I'll talk about why that all is, okay? And then on the other side, you got the Allies, Great Britain, France, and Russia. So these are the major sides. And this is a world war, so obviously a ton of other nations are involved. But these are the big ones, and these are the ones that I need you to know if I were to quiz you. Okay? So big sides of the war. Uh, Italy comes in later on the Allied side, and the Allies leave them out of uh, peace talks at the end. And that's going to make Italy really, really mad going forward. But more on that when we do World War II. Imperialism, I've given you the definition a million times, so I'll stop there. And nationalism, I've talked about nationalism, um, you know, pride and extreme love for your country, but that, that maybe it, it becomes not only that you love your country, but that you hate people who are not a part of your country. And that's, that's again, that's going to be a debated definition. You know, that's something that um, nationalists will argue vehemently against. So I'll try to be as... Uh, uh, in the center as possible and just say pride in our nation is nationalism extreme pride though okay extreme what's gonna happen in a city called Sarajevo on June 14th um, or June 28th 1914 I'm sorry June 28th 1914 is gonna change the world and it's gonna lead to a lot of finger pointing it's gonna lead to the alliances breaking out and so this is where it all all sort of shakes out and it all begins in the Balkan Mountains, okay, there was a uh, bridge over the Mijaka River, and this is the city of Sarajevo. Now, the city of Sarajevo has been a contested city, okay? It's a contested city because uh, on June 28, 1914, the Serbians, who believe Sarajevo is their city, historically it has been their city, well, they lost their city. Okay, um, they lost their city because the Austro-Hungarian Empire had taken over Serbia and said, you're a part of us. Okay, so remember Austria and Hungary, they had the dual monarchy, right? Well, they step in and they take over Serbia because that's what empires do. You know, they take over land. And so they had sort of control at least for a while. Well, the Serbs uh, revolt and the Serbs, you know, back out and so it's it's a situation where the serbians had control of sarajevo they don't but they're they're their own independent nation now they've uh, rebelled against the ottoman empire and kicked them out and so but here's the thing on june 28 1914 they're celebrating their independence day and they're celebrating a day when they killed uh, a leader of the Ottoman Empire, you know, cut his head off. And so that's like what they're celebrating. They're celebrating their independence from the Ottoman Empire and a uh, great battle that they fought. Well, here comes the Archduke of, of, of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, and he's coming into the city of Sarajevo. Technically his, okay, it's his city technically under, you know, if you're going to ask someone who, who owns Sarajevo and they're not a Serbian, they'd probably say it's Austria-Hungary. But the Serbs don't see it that way. They see it as their city, it's their land, and they think that the Austro-Hungarians should give it back. Okay? That's the, the backdrop, if you will. So he comes to, like, the worst day ever. Like, why would you pick this day? 
oh my gosh. But anyway, he picks this day, and what he's going to do is he's going to come into the city, he's going to you know, see some military demonstrations, he's going to take a victory lap because his father, Franz Joseph, he's going to die soon. He's old, and so it's going to be Franz Ferdinand to lead the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And everyone should be happy, and he was. He was happy. He had a pregnant wife with him. I mean, he's just really, really happy. His wife, Sophia. Well, on the other side of things, um, there was a, a group, a bunch of college students that came together and formed this group called the Serbian Black Hand. Um, and the Black Hand, you know, was a, was a group that believed that Sarajevo was theirs, that Serbia should exert its power and take it back. And they felt, felt it was really disrespectful what, what Franz Ferdinand was doing. So they resolved that they would kill him. And so they're a bunch of college kids. They, they don't know what they're doing. They're not like Assassin's Creed or something like that. They are coming together and they're like, okay, well, what do we need? We need a gun. And so they get like some you know, cheap, uh, you know, guns that they can, they can hope will fire. And they get some cyanide. Uh, don't ask me where, but they certainly got some. And they got these uh, makeshift grenades. This is how you know it was like a really, really, uh, um, I don't know, non-professional job. We'll call it that, okay? Where they have these grenades, and they're these grenades that you have to like hit onto something, and that would uh, get the trigger mechanism going, and then that would they would go off. They're not like your Call of Duty flashbang or you know pull the pin kind of things. So you basically have this grenade that you got to hit off of something for it to explode. A gun that you're hoping will will fire. And, uh, some cyanide from some, you know, backdoor, you know, shady, shady guy. And they're out there practicing in the forest. And there was one who was worse than everybody else. Uh, they say it was Gavrilo Princip. He was a really bad shot. I don't know if the guy needed glasses. He probably had poor eyesight like I do. But anyway, really bad shot. And, like, they're shooting. And, like, they, like his shot's, like, going off to the left, going off to the right. He's really terrible. And they're like, man, we hope that, uh, that the, the arch dude's right in front of you because that's the only way you'll hit him. So anyway, that's what's going on, and, and they're plotting, and they're planning, and they know where he's going to go. The The route is published ahead of time, so they know exactly where he's going to be. There's no secrets. He's riding in an open car. They're thinking, like, this is easy. And so uh, they all sort of line up in a, in a line. And basically, you know, I'll, I'll be quick with you here because, again, to, you'd have to listen to it in class and I'll show you the whole layout of the city. But essentially what happens is they try to, to kill the, the Archduke. They use one of those, you know, awful grenades and the grenade goes off, but the grenade goes off in the car behind the Archduke, okay? Like actually hits the Archduke's car. Some say hits him right on the forearm, goes behind the car. And so the assassin scatter, uh, the, the assassin who threw the grenade, Gabrinovich, actually jumps into the Mijaka River and takes this uh, cyanide pill. Thing was, you know, he got it from some shady guy, right? So the cyanide pill, um, it just makes him throw up. It's old. It's too old. The poison didn't didn't work the way that it should have. And the Mijaka River, by the way, this is in the summertime, so, you know, June, right? Well, the water, what does it do in, in the summertime? It evaporates up. And so <laughs> you got the situation where, like, he doesn't, like, splash in the water. He, like, smacks into the water. And then he's got this pill that just makes him, like, vomit. And so you got, like, this, you know, flopping fish in the water, um, in the shallow water. And the police grab him. And they take him away. Now, at that point, when someone throws a grenade at you, you probably just leave the city. You know, just just go home. But he doesn't. Um, Ferdinand continues on his route. He goes to the city hall. He sit, sits in there. Um... Uh, and then he actually wants to come out and he wants to visit some of the people that are in the hospital. That's, that's like what he wants to do. You know, he wants to like say like, oh my gosh, you know, you're in my prayers or whatever. And so he decides uh, to get back in the car and go back the way he came. Well, he's got a, a driver and this, you know, cartographer of sorts. It's like map expert, if you will, in the car with them. And the driver and the map guy, they're like, uh, no, you got to go here to, to get to the hospital. And, and there's the, the car, like, is the remains of the car are still in the way. Like, it's this big scene. There's people still around. So they can't go exactly the way they came. So they decide to, like, take this right turn to to go uh, up Franz Joseph Street. And they they think that that will be the best way to go to the victim's, you know, hospital and whatever. Well, they take the right, and the map guy's like, no, it's not the right way, you know? And they're, like, fighting over, like, how do you get out of this city and get to where you got to go? So they pull over in front of this, like, delicatessen, uh, this place called Schiller's Market. 
and they pull over in front of Schiller's Market. Well, all the assassins had left, except for one, assassin number five, Gavrilo Princip. He had not left. And he had actually gone into Schiller's Market to wait for the heat to go off, and he was just going to leave the city. And he actually, you know, ordered a sandwich or something like that, and he was, like, sitting in the back. Well, he gets up, and uh, he leaves Schiller's Market, and he opens up the door, and he cannot believe it. Because guess who's right in front of him but the Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, okay, with his wife, Sophia. Now, remember, I told you he was really bad shot, so he was, like, point-blank range. He shot, and he missed the Archduke. He actually hit uh, Sophia, his pregnant wife. Wife died in... Uh, instantly says Franz Ferdinand turned around and said oh my god please my dear please don't die something to that effect and uh and then Prince of fires a second shot and that was the shot that killed Franz Ferdinand the car drives away but drives away with two dead Princip is uh taken down by the police uh he is tortured he um he will die in a cell a cell later used by the Nazis, by the way, to interrogate people. So, pretty weird stuff going on here. When this happens, the war is imminent. And you're like, well, why would that be? I mean, it's, this is just some archduke, right? It's a little bit bigger than that. It's a little bit more complicated than that because of the alliance system. Now, uh, there you go. There's Schiller's Market there. Um... The, the wrong turn in history, as it's called. And the horrors of that. Now, Gavrilo Princip is a really interesting guy because he's, you know, he's, he's a nationalist, clearly. And if you get an, a topic on nationalism in the regions, write about, write about Princip because you can write about World War I. But he, he does this, and some people will say, oh my gosh, this, this guy's a, a monster, right? A terrorist is what, they, what they'd say. And other people, the Serbians, they call him a freedom fighter, and he's like the hero of the Serbian people. So there's two ways of looking at this, and I, I won't um, you know, go further into it too much just to say that there's a discussion about Gabriela Prince, of whether he is uh, much more of a hero than a villain, much more of a terrorist than a freedom fighter. And it, it's, worth, it's worth thinking about. So here's what happens next. Once the Archduke is dead, the people of Vienna, um, in Austria, and I'm sorry, I should have said that. Uh, uh, Vienna is a city in Austria. In Vienna, there's rallies held, like, oh my gosh, we need to take out these Serbians. How dare they kill the heir to the throne? And, and some people say this in this photograph here that there's a guy there, uh, Adolf Hitler, who's feeding off of this, and he's going to get his start. He's going to get his purpose uh, in World War One. He's going to get his shot, if you will, uh, as a soldier. So. Uh, Gavrilo Princip is arrested. Uh, there's Princip's gun there. It's now a museum. Um, Schiller's Market is no more Schiller's Market. Now it's just a museum with a you know tourist agency on the side of it and whatever. Um, they even have like the footsteps, uh, but there's a little plaque as to where he where he uh, he, he was, the sidewalk where he took the shots and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> pretty uh, pretty dark stuff, really. Really weird uh, to be there. I don't know if I could. I don't know. It'd be surreal. Anywho, there's the open car uh, uniform. And uh, just by the way, uh, Princip weighed 88 pounds when uh, when they were finally done with him. Now, you got to ask, you know, like, like how do we... Because he, he's buried, actually. He's buried in a grave in Sarajevo. The Austrians never would have done this. But they say that one of the guards who was supposed to uh, bury Prince that they're supposed to bury him like in the backwoods where nobody'd ever find his body because they didn't want the Serbians to see him as the freedom uh, fighter. And so uh, one of the guards was loyal to the Serbian people, and one of the guards actually uh, told you know some of the Black Hand members, "Listen, this is where he's buried," and they went and got him. And eventually, uh, Gavrilo Prince was laid to rest in Sarajevo. So uh, just weird stuff, you know, hero or villain, and you know, very interesting. But point is, okay is that when this happens, everything is set off, okay? Stay with me. If you understand this, you can understand the war. It makes so much sense. You might have to replay it a couple of times, but let me do my best. North west of Serbia. It's in Austria-Hungary is, is the city of Sarajevo, okay? It's a little place. 
a little place represented by that X there. Okay, so you got your X here. This is where uh, it's all going down. That's on June 28th, 1914. Immediately, what Austria-Hungary does is they uh, they call up Serbia and they said, "Listen, they said what you did, allowing uh, our our uh, Archduke to die, going after him, is irrehensible. You 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 will this is unforgivable. Since so we're gonna give you an ultimatum, here's the ultimatum. He said, you are going to give us the people responsible for this, or we're gonna crush you, Serbia. We're gonna crush you." And uh, we want police power. We want our police to go into your borders and be able to have full reign to do any investigations we want. And they gave a bunch of demands, okay? And essentially gave them 48 hours to figure it out. Now, the Serbians are like, there's no way. We can't, we can't meet all the demands. And I, I don't think that the demands that Austria-Hungary gave to Serbia were meant to be met. I think they were just like lofty demands that uh, were, were inspired by anger. But here's the thing. Austria-Hungary had called Germany, and it said Germany. So, you know, we in the center of Europe, you know, will you support us if we go to war? And Germany had been building up their military, uh, and and Germany felt this this real allegiance um, to to, to, to Austria-Hungary in the sense that they're you know these neighboring countries, they're both powerhouse countries in the center, and um, I, I don't know, they they probably felt like that was that was wrong for Serbia to do. Whatever the case, Germany slides over a, a what we call a blank check. And this blank check is a symbol. They don't actually do it, but the, the basic symbol, the basic idea is that um, whatever Austria-Hungary does, Germany has got their back, okay? And, you know, this may go all the way back to, you know, Germany having um, Austria help them take over the area Schleswig, you know, south of Denmark. In any case, those two are together, Germany and Austria-Hungary, all right? Serbia is shaking in its boots because they're small already. They're not going to be able to stand up to Austria-Hungary as it is, but definitely not Germany. Germany might be the strongest nation on the board at this point. We don't know, okay? Point is that they're more powerful than Austria-Hungary, and they're definitely more powerful than Serbia. Uh-oh, what do I do? Well, Serbia has got this heritage. You see, they're Slavic people, all right? That goes all the way back to when we talked about like uh, Roman times, you know, Gauls and Greeks and uh, Macedonians, and you got your Vandals and your Visigoths, all that kind of stuff, the Celts, right? They're Slavs. They are Slavic people. That's their heritage. That's their ethnicity. Well, guess what? There's another group of people that are Slavic. They're the Russians. The Russians are Slavic people. Serbia calls up Russia. And, you know, Tsar Nicholas II, he says, Tsar, brother, right? We are your little brothers. We are Slavic like you. And they play on that ethnicity card. He said, listen, these Germanic people that have fought us for a millennia, they're on our heels again. He said, we need your help. We need you to support us. Do you have our back? And Russia considered it for a while. You know, what, what, what would they do? And they decided that Slavic Brotherhood would unite Serbia and Russia. And so they stepped in and said, yeah, we got your back. Now, the thing about it was, is that because they did that, right, Russia, Russia steps up. Well, there becomes an issue. Russia is friends with France. And France was like, man, Russia, you're ready to mobilize? You're going to get your, your soldiers together on the border? And Russia's like, yeah, it's going to take us some time, but we want to do this. France is like, listen, we have an alliance together, right? The, tri the triple on top, we're, we're allied. And more to the point, Germany way back when, during the Franco-Prussian War, uh, marched their Kaiser, Wilhelm in here, and uh, crowned him in our Hall of Mirrors. We'd like a little bit of revenge if we could. And Russia's like, we, we would love your help. It would create a two-front war. This would be really bad for Germany. You know, do, do you have our back? And France was like, oh, yeah, let's get some revenge. Okay. So now you get Russia and France stepping into the conflict. Italy will say, ah, this looks like an opportunity, you know, uh, and they will eventually come to their side, but not yet. Okay, so you've got Russia and you got France now now involved in this conflict. Well, Germany sees the writing on the wall. They're like, oh my gosh, what do we do? We're going to get hit from both sides. 
Uh oh. So Germany develops a plan. Germany develops a strategy. You see, Russia is going to take some time to mobilize. They know that. Okay. To defeat Russia, what they said is, why don't we go mop up the French? Because that's what we've been doing, right? The French, we've mopped them up, you know, before. Let's do it again. Even though the French are waiting on their border, they, they have forts. We know this. Like, we can catch them off guard. You see what the French had, had done, and uh, I'll use, I'll use uh, uh, my, my color here to, to sort of illustrate this, is, um, is they had put forts all along their border here. They're especially their border right here uh, between uh, Germany and France. And so they've got this border locked down. Well, and you know, you got the capital city of Paris here, or something, something like that. Okay. So Germany says, well, we could fight them straight up. Um, but let's not do that. Let's be smart. Let me see if I can get a different color in here to represent the German forces. So we'll get the blue color here. And Germany, what they decide to do is they 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 take their forces, because they can mobilize fast. They they have been you know militarizing for quite a bit. And so what they do is they decide, hey, let's cut through Belgium. Okay, neutral Belgium, let's cut through Belgium. There is, you know, they're small, they're not that strong. You know, all they do is make waffles. Let's cut through Belgium and we'll hit them before they ever even know it. They'll be waiting for us here. We'll hit them right through Belgium. And the Germans are thinking, it'll cost, I don't know, three days, three weeks, I don't know, a really short time to hit, probably like three weeks. You know, they could do it really fast. And this is, you know, biggest German army that, that we've ever seen before, you know, making like Napoleon's ground army look small. We'll cut right around. We'll leave a little auxiliary force in the in the center here so that they think like we're going to fight, but really we're going to be hitting them from their side. And before they can move their soldiers, we'll have Paris captured. And the guy who comes up with this plan, his name is Alfred von Schlieffen. Okay, and Alfred von Schlieffen uh, dies before executing the plan. Uh, it's, but but the point is this: the German command believes that this strategy, this von Schlieffen plan, this cut through Belgium, is going to be phenomenal. It's going to work. Well. Here's what happens. Germany sets its prison and goes right into Belgium. The Belgians don't back down. They're like, no, you're not. You're not coming right through our land, and you think it's just going to be this walk in the park. And the Germans told them, like, just stand down, and we'll walk right through. Now, there's a lot of conflicting accounts of what the Germans did. Some say they raped and pillaged all the way through. Um, we don't know how much of that's propaganda or not. Um, point is this. When they started to come through, the Belgians fought back. They started shooting through, you know, like in a second floor window, they'd be shooting down. The, they started blowing up railroad tracks. They started blowing up bridges, just making it like a nuisance for them to get through. So you knew Germany was going to get through. You knew that. But the difference here is that uh, by the time the Germans went through and the, by the time they got through Belgium, they had done, uh, they kind of messed up a little bit. Because what the French did, let's see if I can, uh, you know, erase some of my arrows here. What the French uh, did here to represent the French, we were using red, so we used red, is the French began to prepare. So they began to dig a trench right here. And the Germans come through Belgium, finally, right, getting through Belgium, you know, getting all their forces through, and they're like, oh my God, no way, they're ready for us. And so the Germans see this, and they're like, oh, man, so let's just do what they do. And they started to build a trench. And they began to settle in, and they began to try to fight. And what we achieve here is we achieve nothing <laughs> called a stalemate, where no side's going to win, where they, they sort of hunker down, and they begin to fight. Now, here's the big problem. Here's what Germany really, really messed up on. Belgium was neutral. Belgium had a big brother of sorts, too. Someone who had pledged that if anyone ever attacked you, little Belgium, I got your back. That nation was Great Britain. That nation might have been the most powerful nation in, in the world in terms of economics, in terms of imperialism, in terms of their navy. Uh, not in terms of their infantry, for sure, but definitely their navy. And Great Britain says, you messed up Germany. Now it's war. And so Great Britain joins on the side of France and on the side of Russia, okay? Seeing 
an opportunity to take back Serbia because Serbia really kind of, you know, starts this whole thing, right, in, in some ways with their, their black hand. I, again, did Serbia support the black hand? No, but the, the people of the black hand are considered Serbians. So, uh, the country that it had Serbia way, way, way back was the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottoman Empire actually says, I'll help you, Germany. I'll help you, Austria, Hungary. We'll go and we'll just, you know, defeat these Serbs and I'll take back my land as a sick old man of Europe. I want my land back that I had lost. And so the Ottoman Empire joins in. And now you start to see the alliances shifting where things are getting to be where you've got in the middle, the central powers and the green nations on the outside are going to be the allied powers. I'm not going to go through how Greece and Albania and Africa join in or Portugal. It's not, not super important for us, but, but that's the basic story. I hope that makes sense. I hope that helps you, uh, going forward because that's so important to understand. So now that we've got this war established, let's keep moving. Let me turn off draw and zoom here. All right. Now the rest of the war, I'm going to go through. Fairly quickly, we'll spend a lot more time in class, you know, to really experience it. But there's uh, Alfred uh, von Schlieffen there. There's the von Schlieffen plan, so you can, like, really see it. That's that blue line there. That's where uh, France had already been mobilized. They push through. And basically what happens is uh, because it took them so long, the uh, people of France are able to mobilize. And because they mobilize, they fight this brutal battle called the Battle of the Marne. Just grotesque, the, the amount of... You know, awfulness that this war causes, but essentially the Germans will fire at forts, and you know their 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 comrades will fall. The Germans will they'll, they'll just like fall left and right, they'll create like bodies, and people will hide behind the bodies, and they'll keep charging forward at the forts, knowing that they're going to lose because the machine guns are just blasting into the Germans. You know they're blasting them, they're just destroying them, but they they keep going forward, they keep going forward. It's it's this nastiness, it really is. And what we start to see is a Western Front developing. We haven't talked about the East yet because the Russians are still mobilizing, but, but the Western Front has been established and what the French do is they dig trenches and the Germans dig trenches and it's like this constant digging to try to outflank each other. And No one outflanks each other, but um, we'll talk about tactics in a little bit. That's what a trench looks like, six foot deep, seven foot wide. And there's your von Schlieffen plan. Now, to bring a little humanity into this, I read this book in front of the, my students, Shooting at the Stars. It basically shows the Christmas truce, a time where uh, both sides, the French and the Germans, actually put down their arms and celebrated Christmas and played soccer and things like that together. But that was the um, not the norm. This was a, a moment where they recognized our humanity for just a little bit. But that's all going to go away. Now... A lot of pictures. So there's the soldiers in the trenches. It rained a lot in France, especially northern France. And so you get all this rain and it fills up the trenches and then you get your feet wet. It's going to be some nasty stuff that develops as a result. But here's some trenches. The, the amount of mud. Jeez. It's just, it, it's, it's incredible to think that people, I mean, they, they kind of lived in the trenches in many ways. They fought in the trenches. They slept in the trenches. It was, it was everything to them. So... Let me tell you why I would never want to fight in World War One. Number one is the mud. It was everywhere. It was always on you, you know, always permeating your clothes and making you constantly wet, right? And that's not good for the human skin, by the way, because it leads to what we call trench foot. And trench foot is basically like where your uh, feet are eaten apart by bacteria because bacteria grow in moisture, right? And so that bacteria would eventually eat away at their, their feet, and we'll see that in some images unfortunately. Um, you've got your trench uh, mouth, and that comes because there's not a lot of, everything's eaten by can, and so the canned goods lack vitamin C, it leads to scurvy, and then they, they're losing their teeth, and it's just this awful rot that develops in their mouth, and uh, really gross stuff. Basically, their mouth starts to rot away. Trench fever, they said everybody had a little bit of trench fever. It just depends on like the amount. So, um, trench fever is a result um, because lice traveled into these um, uh, these areas, these trenches, very easily, and so the lice would be on you all the time. Well, some of the lice, uh, what would happen is they like bury themselves um, and cause this condition called pyrexia, where they bury themselves into your skin and into your bloodstream, and they poison your bloodstream, and it would lead to trench fever. It's pretty nasty. Uh, shell shock. 
hearing the bombs go off over and over again because of the German mortars, which were really, really effective, by the way, would lead like uh, craters the size of cars. Enormous, absolutely enormous. I mean, this is industrialized warfare, guys. It's brutal. But the shell shock, the constant bombing, what it would do is it would drive guys crazy. It's like that constant, constant noise over and over again, and they would just lose their mind. Uh, poisonous gas would start to be used later in the war by the Germans, and they at sometimes they were kind of hoping that the wind was blowing that day in the way that it needed to be, like towards the other trench, because if it blew backwards, it would go into your trench. But there were two types of poison gas. Uh, chlorine gas, which is an asphyx asphyxiate, which would make it so that you couldn't breathe. And then mustard gas, which goes into anything that's moist. And remember, I mean, everything's you know, wet in the trenches, but any moisture, any, any exposed skin, mustard gas would get onto it and then it would blister your skin. So that's why you saw the gas masks and things like that is because they're trying to protect against the mustard gas and it leads to blindness. And so you see like a lot of like the walking wounded basically as these people are trying to uh, uh, hope that the, their senses will come back, that their uh, eyes will come back. Because remember, your eyes are very moist and that's where the mustard gas targeted. It's brutal, absolutely brutal. Um, the rats were everywhere. The British developed, um, uh, you know, rat catching dogs to make sure that uh, they could they could fight back against the rat population. Uh, a lot of rats were eaten because there's a lot of them. But you got to understand why the rats were there. They're there to get the dead bodies and get to the cadavers. Just this, you know, really nasty stuff. And then you got dysentery because they didn't understand some of the things that we understand today. So their um, latrine, shall we say, their bathroom trench was often too close to their regular trench, and because it rained a lot, the latrine would bleed into the regular trench and it created some nasty stuff as you can imagine getting into your trench pretty gross so there you go you got your awful awful uh, scene here this battlefield my gosh you got no man's land uh, which is the center between the trenches okay that that stretch of land and basically what they would do is they would scream you know they'd get ready everyone get ready bayonets fixed you know and then they'd scream over the top and that meant that you had to run over the trenches or you would just hear a whistle sometimes you charge into no man's land the other side would mow you down with machine gun fire and mortars you would, even if you got to the other side of the trench, there was uh, barbed wire that you'd get caught in, so you'd, you'd rarely ever make it there. You'd try to clip off the barbed wire, but that's while machine gun fire is laid upon you and mortar shells and all that nasty stuff going at you. And then, when it would inevitably fail, the other side would do the same thing. Again, guys, it doesn't make sense, but that's the way that they did warfare. Old battle tactics, you know, charging and going right in at the enemy. Uh, meeting the modern technology. It was this recipe for disaster. There's your barbed wire. And in the end, right, just leads to disaster. So, there's your rats for you. More rats than you ever want to see in your life. Here are some uh, images to help you understand what the chlorine gas does remember that's that's the asphyxiate so you can't breathe and there's the mustard gas the blistering agents and you see that on the right there there's the trench mouth being uh, destructive there's trench foot some gross stuff guys um, by the way this has a lasting effect on the landscape not to get too like you know geography on you here but if you look at the landscape, I mean, it's still pockmarked to this very day. It's still got the lines of the trenches to this very day. So it's it's left an impact, uh, one that's forever on the landscape. Okay. Uh, different weaponry, and I'll go fast through this. I think you know you understand a lot of this stuff. But long-range cannons will be developed, accurate long-range cannons. We talked about the chemical weapons. U-boats uh, is a feature that's going to really play a big part in this war. Airplanes is going to be something new, not just uh, you know fighter planes like maybe you're thinking. That's I mean, it's more like World War II. But um, you get some fighter planes starting here, particularly the Red Baron. But you get a lot of the scouting too. Um, so they use planes to scout the enemy and figure out where the enemy movements were going, and that was really important. You get your machine guns, which is the most important weapon to understand. This is what takes the death toll so high is because those machine guns you can kill so many in such a uh, you know, in a clip, you know, if you will. And I hate to sound so callous about that, by the way. I'm not trying to be. It's just this brutal methodology, and um, I don't know. 
stay too long, I'll get too sad. Uh, we got our tanks, and we got our flamethrowers. Flamethrowers, early flamethrowers, okay? Not not well developed. We'll talk about flamethrowers when we talk about World War II in the Pacific Theater, but but they start here. Can you imagine a shell weighing 1,700 pounds, the size of a car, being launched at you? It's it sounds like I'm making it up, you know, and I'm I'm not. It's it's just that uh, unbelievable to think that the German howitzer would carry a shell that big and shoot a shell that big and accurate. And it was. It was more accurate. It was larger than any other thing that was ever invented. The Germans are really on the, um, on the leading and cutting edge of military technology. There's your walking wounded. That's mustard gas. That's what you, it does to people. Uh, there's an aerial chemical attack. I don't know what that that is. It's probably chlorine gas. Um, if I had to guess, that's what I would say it would be. But they're launching that from the sky. That's such terrible stuff. Then you get the early gas masks. They develop into something a little bit more improved. And now you've got naval warfare with the U-boats, undersea boats, as the as the Germans called them, right? And the um, Allied powers hated these, by the way. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, you've got Baron Manfred von Richthofen. I am not pronouncing that correctly, but he's the Red Baron, and they they had the dog fights and uh, the back and forth. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, he had 80 kills before being shot down. They say he was being shot down uh, by some guy in a trench that actually got lucky and pointed his gun up at the right time and caught him. But um, ba Red Baron, the reason why he used red is because that would blind people. He would fly into the sun and he'd come out of it and you couldn't see him because of the red and the clash. And so that's why um, he did that. But it was very effective. There's your rapid fire machine gun. Invented by an American, but Germany had 100,000 of these weapons. And so they were able to really, really devastate the landscape. You had your armored tanks. This was this was much later in the war, and they weren't very good. They were actually really bad, and the pockmarked landscape of the shells made it really, really difficult for them to do a whole lot with these tanks. Tanks are really more World War II than anything. But again, this is where things get introduced. This is where we're changing the style of warfare eventually, too. So things are changing here. I just want to introduce them to you. You get telecommunication. This is like, you know, using telegraph lines and things like that. Yeah, they did some of that. They also did a lot of what they call running, where you just, you know, you say, uh, you're my runner. Pick a guy. And you got, like, the worst job, you know, because now you have to run across... Uh, you know, maybe through no man's land to get to somebody that's stuck in the middle and get a message to them uh, or cross trench lines. It was a very dangerous job. They say that your uh, lifespan's measured in hours. You know, uh, you, you're not going to last very long as a runner. Well, there was one guy who was a runner for the German army. Uh, his name was Adolf Hitler. And he gets hit um, with mustard gas, uh, but he doesn't die. He doesn't die. And that, that, uh, Keep that in the back of your mind. There's something to that story um, much later on. So this is the result of World War I. Absolute destruction. And here we are in World War I. So you've got this very complicated map, I guess, in many ways. The Eastern Front is the, is the Russian... Uh, you know, battle between the Germans and, and the Austro-Hungarians to a to an extent too. That side of things is pretty pretty devastating, and I, I really spend a lot of time talking about it when I talk about um, the Russian Revolution. But essentially, know this: the Russians are mobilized, and they have more men, but they they are not. Many of them are not professional soldiers. A lot of them are just peasants, sort of. You know, way back, you know, think about like feudal times, kind of these you know peasant farmers who really don't know exactly what's going on or why they're even in this conflict. They know this that they need to go because uh, the Tsar demands that they go. He said the Tsar is not going to give them any supplies to go. Like one in four by the end of the war, one in four soldiers are not given a gun. Twenty-five percent of your force is not given a gun. You're just told because you have the numbers, just you know, wait for the guy to die in front of you and then take a gun. I mean, it's down to that level. So the Russians have more people, for sure, but they are so poorly managed by the Tsar and so uh, underfed, undersupplied, that they are, are not doing so well. Let's put it that way, out in the Eastern Front. In the West, uh, stalemate. They're holding it up. 
And then, you know, the Germans have a lot of firepower. They're very strong, but they're, they're fighting a two-front war, and that's very hard on them. They're also fighting against Great Britain, who's a powerful, you know, nation in their own right. And France is no slouch, so you've got that um, battle going on. So this is the scene. This is what's going on. And here's what pro where propaganda really has an influence on the war. And the British were really good at this. They portray Germany as, as the bad guy. And they do it because, number one, they say Germany should not have invaded Belgium. They're neutral, right? Germany kind of saw it as, you know, we're just going to cut through your nation. Like, just get out of our way. And we wouldn't have had a problem with you if you hadn't started bombing every bridge between here and, and the Marne. But, anywho, that's what they did. Number two, Germany is the first to use chemical weapons. They create and use the, the mustard gas and uh, the chlorine gas and so together that's you know stretching the boundaries of what warfare is and it's it's nasty you know what i mean it's just brutal so from that perspective they're the bad guy and then number three germany's a cheater what do i mean by that well this is old school mentality warfare where you're supposed to you know fight your enemy on the on the field with honor and you know step by step and you, you march right at them and you can see your enemy well germany fights where you can't see them and what i'm talking about is the winter sea boats the u-boats they are using those u-boats against the british navy and eventually they start to use them against this country who keeps getting in the middle of things um, some would say inadvertently, others would say quite intentionally. And so uh, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the United States of America. And I know this is a global class, but you got to talk about America when you talk about World War One, because they are the tipping point. They change everything. And it starts with the sinking of the Lusitania. This is not the reason we enter war. It's one reason why we enter war. Okay, and there are many. The sinking of the Lusitania, the Lusitania is a passenger ship, and it's sunk by a German U-boat. Now, when this happens, it's outraging many Americans. Here's the deal. When you get propaganda like this, of course, you know, it's a nasty image. They sink one of our ships. Now, the Germans had said, listen, you cannot bring your ships over here. You, you can't cross and, and, and come in and bring your ships over to Great Britain, because that's where the Lusitania was heading. They had published news in newspapers saying, listen, America, and listen, Americans, do not go on this ship, the Lusitania, because we will sink it. They said that. And yet people still got on the ships. People still went over. Now, we find out later on that in the Lusitania, now there's a passenger ship. So that means like, you know, like cruise ship, okay? Like cruise line, like you're going to have some fun or something like that, okay? It's supposed to go just, you know, from America to Great Britain. Well, on that ship, there were some guns or ammunition. How do I know that? Well, when the torpedo hit, okay, and they torpedoed the, the ship, there was not one explosion, there were two explosions, okay? The second one was bigger because they had set off a bunch of ammunition there. And so, you know, on the one hand, Lusitania, for Americans, they, they don't care. It doesn't matter what was on the ship. Doesn't matter, and they don't even know that that's on the ship. What matters is that you got dead Americans there, and that's a problem. That's wrong. Okay, so these evil Germans, what they'll start to call them is the Germanic Huns, right? They're going parking back to the Germanic tribes who invaded Rome. Okay, they're going to call them the Huns. So these German Huns are, are monsters, right? But that's not enough to get us into war just yet. Okay, you think maybe that would be, but it's, it's not. And it happens early. You know, you're talking uh, 1915. There's a Lusitania propeller still in Ireland. It goes down in 18 minutes, and it's outside of Ireland when it happens. And you got 1,201 people dying, 123 of which are Americans. That's one. Here's another reason. Uh, maybe a, uh, something that really, really strikes us. Arthur Zimmerman, uh, foreign secretary, sends a telegram. Uh, he's a German foreign secretary, I'm sorry. Sends his telegram from Germany to Mexico. Here's what it says. It says, hey, Mexico, you fought this thing called the Mexican-American War. Did you not? Like, yeah. Like, you lost Texas. Remember, like, you know, remember the Alamo or something like that? Um, you lost Texas. You lost New Mexico. You lost Arizona, didn't you? Like, yeah, we did. It wasn't right. It wasn't fair. Manifest destiny hurt us. Like, what if we told you that we'd give you back that land? And Mexico's like, 
okay, <laughs> like, we'll give you it back, but um, you need to start a war with the United States. You need to just keep them busy, keep them occupied, okay? And we'll come and we'll help you, okay? But you just gotta hold the front, like hold the line there, keep them occupied, so we can like mop up the French over here. We think the Russians are gonna quit soon. Um, theirs are is terrible. Like so, we'll have this thing wrapped up over in Europe. We'll sign peace. We'll march through all the mirrors one more time, you know. And then we'll come over and we'll, we'll, we'll defeat America for you. They send that telegram over. Well, the British pick up on this telegram. The British, you know, Central Intelligence picks it up. And they're like, oh, this is perfect. Like, Britain is like, you know, not doing so hot in the war. There's a stalemate. How do you break the stalemate? America. And they give this telegram to America, and they're like, listen, this is what those evil German who, you know, fight under the water and have these chemical weapons, went through Belgium and did horrible things in Belgium. Look at what they're trying to do. They're coming after you. And America's like, rolling up their sleeves. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's how we want to go. You might have made a mistake. You messed with the wrong one. Okay, this is number two. Strike number two. Well, America plays baseball, right? Well, they need a third strike. This is just they're like almost there, right? Like this is oh, I just want to go after Germany, but but this is the final straw. We end neutrality because Germany uh, uses something called unrestricted submarine warfare. They said, "Hey, America, if you come into the waters of the uh, Atlantic, we will strike you down." Just know that. We're going to destroy your ships. I don't care if it's passenger or otherwise. We will destroy all ships. So don't come into my swimming pool, says Germany, right? And America's like, you're messing with the wrong one. President Woodrow Wilson, who had said I would keep you out of war, he ran on that platform. He's like, I am not going to go to war. He's like, well, we're going to go to war. <laughs> Changes his mind. And, you know, some people say for, for the better, some people say for the worse. I'm not here to tell you. I'm just tell, here to tell you that's what he did. Okay, on April 2nd, 1917, he goes to war. And all the propaganda flows out. The Uncle Sam cartoons that are challenging young men to go to war. The, these cartoons here, these posters, I should say, that, um, you know, say, oh, my gosh, you're just really challenging your manhood in many ways. You know, if, if I was a man, I joined the military, you know, really coming at young men and trying to get them to, to sign up. <laughs> Uh, the British do the same thing, and ultimately, here's what happens. America is going to come into this war. It takes us a little bit to mobilize, though. So while we're mobilizing, the Russians lead the war. They sign this treaty called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and they back out. They say they can't do it anymore. Their czar had mismanaged the war. People are starving. Uh, soldiers are hiding in the trenches. They're not actually fighting against the Germans. They don't want to fight. They don't want to fight. They want to eat. They want some bread. That's what they want. You know what I mean? So the Russians pull out of the war and sign the Treaty of Brest Litovsk. And um, just so you know, this treaty is signed. The Russians are going through a revolution. Whole lecture on that, okay? But this is the thing that gets Russia out of the war, okay? Vladimir Lenin doing his work. So there's more to that story, but just know Russia leaves as America's entering. And there's your Russian soldiers. And there's your hammer and sickle. Russian revolution is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, so here we go. America is going to come across. Now, here are some things that we do to make sure that we come across successfully. We develop what are called destroyers. If you've ever played Battleship before, it's those big, big, long ships like I got up top. And the destroyers are armed with, with torpedoes that can hit you. And one of the things that these destroyers have is they have radar. That radar allows them to see under the water. So, when the Germans think that they're slick with their U-boats and they're underwater, they can't be seen, America says, no, 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 we can see a mile away. And destroying these U-boats with these, with these uh, torpedoes, they're essentially uh, finding the kryptonite to these Germans. So that's one thing that we do. Another thing that we do is we vary the points of entry so the Germans can't tee off on us and know where our men are coming. So we're always varying our different points and we're coming, you know, northern France and we're central and we're southern and we're, we're always hitting them in different spots. And that's how we're getting men into France. So we're starting to get our men mobilized. We're getting them across successfully and the Germans can't touch us because of these destroyer ships, because of radar. So it's, it's genius in many ways. So we're destroying those ships. 
And when the Americans come over, we call you know we're called doughboys because you know we're like fresh. You know we haven't seen combat, we haven't seen uh, uh, warfare, even though you know like you know, 1865 the Civil War. But that's you know, none of these guys have fought in that. Many of them fought maybe in the Spanish American War, uh, but not even that. So you got the situation where. America comes in, they're fresh, these huge buttons uh, that they have on their coats. Uh, they, they look like squirts of dough, so that's why we call them dough boys. And they come across and they help because America has this different mentality coming to war. Okay, The mentality is not to sit in trenches. Uh, they look at it and they're like, this is gross. <laughs> like, you've been sitting in here for three, for three, four years now? I mean, my gosh, it's awful. He said, um... No, we're going to come forward. We're going to move forward. And it will cost them in some battles. Uh, like the Argonne Force is going to cost them. But what they do is they always keep this like constantly churning, moving forward. And because they have the numbers and because they're fresh and they're, they're well supplied and they are able to supply their buddies, they can do the offensive. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> these Americans are, are coming in and they turn the tide of the war. Uh, Chateau Thierry in France is a battle that, that we enter in. That's in June. What we do in Chateau Thierry is we stop the German offensive. The Germans you know, sh kind of start to push forward because, remember, um, the, 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 the Russians are pulling out. And so the Germans start to move forward. Well, at Chateau Thierry, we said, no, you're not moving. Okay. In fact, we're going to start moving. And in the second battle, in Bella Wood, we turn this thing. This is like our turning, but this is where things are going to change. Because at Bella Wood, what we do is uh, we get the Germans not not only just to stop their offensive, but now they're moving backward. Now they're on the retreat. Now they see, oh my gosh, the writing's on the wall. We might lose this thing. And the last battle is the one that I referred to earlier, the Argonne Forest. And this is the one where a famous uh, guy, Charles Whittlesey, who will watch a film on the Lost Battalion, gets lost in the Argonne Forest because they were given orders to push forward when there were no supports on their flank. They were told there would be, but there, there wasn't. And they get caught in the forest and they have to hold out. And Charles was a lot of men in that forest, but he does. He holds. He holds and like a, a thorn in the side of the, the German's belly. But ultimately, it's at the Argonne Forest where that's that's it that's like the final big battle that we fight and because of charles whittlesey and his men's bravery we are able to to claim victory and germany signs a, an armistice which is a ceasefire they said we're going to stop shooting at each other and we need to sign some sort of peace on 11 11 1918 at 11 o'clock a.m peace is going to be reached okay armistice day as you know So here's our AEF, there's the Argonne Forest. We'll do more with that in class, but here's the thing. We turn the tide, right? But the French want the surrender. They're like, oh, I'm, thanks America, but we got it from here. And they come in front of us and they wanna to talk to Germany and they wanna say, Listen, buddy, remember what you did at the Palace of Versailles when you crowned your Kaiser in the Hall of Mirrors. You thought that was really cute, right? We're going to take uh, everything that you love and hold dear. You thought Alsace and Lorraine was, was a beautiful place. We'll take that back, you know? And um, it's the Palace of Versailles where everything's going to change. So here's what they do. They get the Germans into a, a railway car. And they've got like a bunch of papers, uh, you know, this uh, railway car outside uh, of Paris. This a bunch of papers, you know, stack. And it's uh, it's a treaty. Yeah, and they're, they're riding to Versailles. And it was the the, the place where, you know, Louis the Sun King and, and Marie Antoinette and uh, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, right? This, this is their, their crib. And that's where they're they're going. They're going to Versailles, right? Because that's, that's the place where they're going to sign this thing. And they, they take the railway car. And they said, uh, before we get there, sign it. They're going to be like, so he's like, what? He signed what? And uh, they're like, sign the treaty of Versailles. Like, oh, wait a minute. And they step out, and uh, Germany's like, can you can we read it? I'm like, no, we want you to sign it here, and we'll do an official signing in the front. The, the, the Hall of Mirrors, we'll do it right there. Germany didn't have a choice, right? And so they sign it, because in the, the opposite is, well, they get smashed by the allies right and destroyed and the whole country is destroyed and so they have to sign it well 
if they had listened to, to America, I don't think that it would have been such a vicious peace treaty. But because it was France and where they were coming from, this was about vengeance. This was about, you know, taking back what Germany had stolen from them after the Franco-Prussian War. It becomes a brutal peace treaty. And what some historians say is that this is going to start World War II. Germany has to sign what's called the War Guilt Clause. They accept total blame for the war. Basically, that this entire war, which had something to do with Sarajevo and the Black Hand and Gavrilo Princip, is all because of Germany. Okay? They have to pay the reparations, $32 billion. They have to get rid of their air force and their navy, besides a token army of 100,000 soldiers. That's it. No tanks, no nothing. 100,000, that's your, that's your army. That's it. Okay? Germany, all those colonies, gone. Get rid of them all. You imperialist nation, you. We'll keep our colonies, though, in Vietnam, you know, because that's what we want to do. And um, you have to stay 50 kilometers away from the Rhine River, your homeland, where all those German-speaking people are. Yeah, you don't even don't even think about Alsace and Lorraine. That's like definitely ours. But we're gonna push you back even further. Okay? How does it feel? How does it feel, Germany? And there's nothing that they can do about it, and France knows it. They know it. So Germany is obviously gonna be angry over this treaty, but again, they're powerless to stop it. And what it's going to do is it's going to put them into a depression, a great depression, an economic depression. Not just a, you know, probably a mental depression too, but but a, an economic one where they can't pay back the reparations and function as a country. They can't defend themselves. They have nothing, guys. They have nothing. Now, other changes as part of this treaty that I should say, and there's many more, but uh, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, those are two nations that are created as Slavic nations. So the the... Uh, nations of Europe recognize that the Slavic people do need separate countries. They, they felt like that was necessary. And Serbia, of course, is, is speaking up for that. They're like, yeah, let's do that. Because, you know, that's why we, you know, uh, why our black hand was created in the first place. Okay. Austria-Hungary is now broken back up into two countries. Guess what the two are? All right. I won't, I won't make you guess Austria and Hungary um, through the Treaty of St. Germain. Now, on the other side, you know, President Woodrow Wilson, he's got some ideas. He's like, well, you know, I have my, my ideas for the treaty. And President Wilson was famous for, like, going and talking way too much. So I'll try to just break it down for you really quickly. He called it the 14 points. Whenever you got a 14-point plan, you've got, like, um, I don't know, way too many points. Maybe, like, 11 points too many. Um, but essentially what he wanted to do is he wanted to create one alliance system. An alliance system where everybody was on the same team. There was no allies versus uh, central powers. There was just a League of Nations. And all nations would come together. And if one nation was doing bad or, you know, want to take over something, then all of the nations would join together. And they believed in diplomacy. And let me make that clear. Like, we should come together, not just to, like, crush that nation or something, but to, like, smooth things over and do it through a diplomatic means. Okay? The League of Nations is something that was created. Number two, he argues for something called self-determination. This is where Czechoslovakia, you know, and uh, Austria and Hungary, where uh, you know, Yugoslavia, where those nations really became born is because of self-determination. The idea was if you wanted a nation, it was up to the people that lived in the area. And those people, if they organized together, they could apply for nationhood. They could, they could become their own nation. It was the people determining the nation, not some foreign, you know, outside nation telling you what to do. It's very hypocritical. You think about all the imperialist things that we've done. But anyway, that's the idea. Self-determination. You have the right to form your own nation as clearly as I can make it. Now, here's the thing. Americans want nothing to do with this. They come back from the war first, war hardened. They, the, the boys that come back are changed, right? Number one. Number two, they don't know why. They, they you know, Come on, like this war over archdukes and you know the black hands and all this. No, no, like we we crushed Germany. That was what we needed to do. Let's leave and let's leave Europe out of this. We we want nothing to do with them. Germany has been reduced to nothing. Let's go. And so all the nations, the allies, you know, and the central powers, they say, yeah, let's we'll join the League of Nations. Everyone but America. So America pushes to isolationism and um, leave the rest of Europe alone. And there's Woodrow Wilson going to Versailles. He's trying to get people on the League of Nations side. But essentially, you've got this. You've got peace terms. And uh, 
You're being forced, right, to take these peace terms. That's the, 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 the brutal end to this war.